Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Green, and I am director of the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate. And I'd like to welcome you back after a summer hiatus to Lusk Perspectives. Last year, we did more than 40 programs, uh, webinars, and podcasts. And we are planning to maybe not do quite so many this year because people are allowed to go out of their houses now. Uh, but we'll still do two or three a month for the coming academic year. And it's great to be starting off this year with uh, an issue that I'm sure is on many of your mind, which is prop tech and its influence on real estate. And one of the last areas of the economy, I think it's fair to say, that has not been seriously disrupted by technology has been real estate. And I like to cite one favorite statistic in this regard. If you look at manufacturing productivity compared to the end of World War II, it's about 11 times greater than it was then. If you look at agricultural productivity, it's about eight times greater. If you look at construction productivity, it's 6% greater. So it is, um, and these are the numbers according to McKinsey. I don't always trust McKinsey, but actually they have this one pretty well documented. So I'm gonna trust McKinsey on this one. Um, and so if you ever think of an area that's ripe for disruption, it would be a place that's had basically zero growth in productivity in a very long period of time. Uh, while certainly we've had well-known firms such as Zillow and Redfin come into the market, and I think in a way have been disruptive in the sense that consumers know far more about real estate now than they did 15, 20 years ago. I, I don't think there's any mistaking that. Still, a lot of the models that we thought might change, like models and brokerage and property management and so on, really have not changed all that much um, since the rise of the web. And what we have with us today are three people who are working on changing that, on bringing the pr productivity of technology to the real estate space. And I think we're going to have a great conversation with them. Um, we have Travis Putnam. And Travis, are you down in Century City? Today. I am. Yeah. So Travis is sitting in very old, wonderful, but old school real estate uh, mm -hmm. off of Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Navitas. Um, we have with us Tyler Scriven. Uh, are you with us from Atlanta today? I am. Tyler? I'm yeah. trying to show space still does kind of matter, <laughs> although we are in various places. And he is the founder and CEO of Saltbox, which is a company that is bringing technology to logistics to try to make it more efficient. And last but not least, we have Ashley Colella, Senior Product Manager from um, HQO. And just in case I, I told a stupid joke was, you know, is HQO looking to be, is it liquid or looking to be liquid soon? HQO stands for Headquarters, oops, Operations? Optimized. Optimized, sorry about that. Uh, and, and so what we're going to do is I, I've asked all three of these people to say a few words about what they do and what they're up to, and, and then we will start a conversation. And I think um, because I've known Travis the longest, I know he's in a really good position to give us some background on what this whole sector is about. So again, Travis, thanks for being with us and take it away. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Great to be here. Um, always excited to uh, have an opportunity to talk about technology, uh, meeting the uh, the built world um, and technology applied to the real estate and construction industries. So, um, you know, we've been, Navitas has been investing in startups uh, exclusively uh, in this space for the last decade. Um, you know, time timing is important. So like Richard's uh, stats about, you know, productivity gains in construction and, and, and how in many ways, right? It just, uh, you know, over the last many decades, like it just hasn't been the right time yet for, you know, these spaces to really uh, benefit from digitization and uh, the benefits of technology. Like we are, you know, frankly, when we started Navitas, that wasn't the case either. We were probably, you know, five or six years too early, uh, just kind of looking back on it uh, with some hindsight. You know, we spent a lot of time just trying to educate people on like, man, this is, this is a, these are big, obviously big markets, but, you know, there's a reason uh, that a number of technology companies are going to be formed here that are going to create value. Um, and so as a firm, what we do is, uh, it, you know, invest in, in companies at the C to Series B stage, uh, uh, like Tyler's company at Saltbox and, and um, like Ashley's company at HQO. Um, and we really provide capital and domain expertise and market access to help them grow. Um, uh, we have watched the space go from like a slow trickle of capital and like, you know, a relatively small handful of founders innovating and building companies back in like 2011 to 2012 
to a universe today of somewhere, you know, eight, 9,000, you know, companies in aggregate uh, in the prop tech ecosystem across the different categories and subgroups. Um, and we've gone from, you know, uh, like sub hundred million dollars of total venture capital being invested in the space back in 2011 till today. Uh, looks like it's going to be roughly kind of 15 billion of venture uh, capital into the prop tech space in, in 2021. Um, and, you know, in many ways, like it, it's finally like it's time, you know, like when we look at, uh, you know, for the space to really make an impact, we, we um uh, have watched, you know, a number of companies, like early companies that have demonstrated leadership in the space go public in the last 18 months, you know, roughly $60 billion of public market cap has been created in, in the prop tech space. And so early investors have been rewarded for taking some early risk. Uh, and we are just continuing to see like the influx of, of more capital coming in, uh, you know, a greater number of founders uh, looking to build, you know, the next uh, great company. Uh, in this area. And then, you know, by most importantly, like the, the, the market demand for digital solutions coming out of COVID uh, has just been tremendous. And so, you know, you kind of mix all those things together and this is a pretty, uh, uh, you know, active time in, in the, in the prop tech space. So a couple of things, first of all, I think the, the majority of our audience knows what our raising money in the B period is, but some people may not. So if you could, just explain very briefly what that is. Yeah. And then I have a follow-up question. Sure. Yeah. So typically when we invest in a startup, we're, we're, we're oftentimes like first institutional uh, capital in. A lot of times founders are able to go out and raise a friends and family round or like a seed round, um, you know, capital from from either, you know, high net worth people they know or, or like maybe locals, like small funds that are in the business of funding, you know, kind of local innovation. We like to be... Uh, either the first sort of institutional check-in or part of like the first institutional round into, you know, these businesses. And, you know, there's no like perfect science in, in, in venture in terms of like company maturity and when that might occur, but that's generally sort of how we like to do, you know, how we like to take um, our initial positions in companies. So the other thing I want to follow up with you on is you talked about a 15, about 15 billion of funding right now. And just some context, the, re, the market cap of REITs is a little north of a trillion dollars right now. So if I'm doing my math correct, that's one and a half percent of re in a, in a stable equilibrium, what would you see as the amount of venture funding out there relative to what we'll call, and, and not all real estate companies are REITs, but we'll, let's just use that as a proxy. Yeah. yeah. Um, the amount of capital that's in the market, the pub public capital that's in the market. Yeah, great, great data point. So yeah, I think this is fundamental to the thesis and that like real estate being the largest asset class on the planet, like there's ju just a enormous market segment. Um, and, you know, let's, and then, and then you kind of juxtapose that to venture capital as a market segment, which is this like teeny tiny fraction of a corner of alternatives, like in aggregate in 2021, which will be you know, the, 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 the strongest sort of funding year on history for venture capital will be an aggregate somewhere around $250 billion total. Prop tech, fintech, health tech, you know, all categories. And with, so within that, if you look at prop tech, let's call it 15 billion. I mean, you're looking at, you know, um, I don't know, like what's that, what's the math on that? Five, like like roughly 5%, 5%, five, 6% of aggregate is going now into the prop tech category. Like in contrast, fintech, which is, so I like to argue, you know, seven or eight years, nine years ahead of where, you know, prop tech is and sort of like directionally where we like to say prop tech may be heading, you know, fintech this year just reported like 30 billion in venture capital in just Q2 alone. And it will make up probably, you know, uh, in the year ahead, you know, nor, nor, you know, call it 15% of aggregate venture. So if we're trying to think about where we're headed as a space, like those are some interesting kind of like guideposts to think about. Like we're always going to be tiny relative to, you know, uh, um, you know, the asset, you know, they call it re public market cap or fund flows into, you know, in, in, in the, into the real estate sector, but, you know, uh, uh, small shifts that can occur from like digital technologies or companies that get built out of this can have, you know, giant, you know, enormous impact on how asset value or how value uh, creation is achieved within, you know, the real estate market. Okay, I, I'm going to follow up with you a little further on that, but I'd like to now turn it over to Tyler 
Uh, Tyler, tell us what you guys are up to and uh, what our audience should know. Sure. Uh, Richard, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Tyler Scriven. I'm uh, founder and CEO of a company called Saltbox. Saltbox was founded in 2019, as Travis mentioned, Navitas is uh, one of our both investors uh, and also real estate partners, interestingly. Um, we are building uh, very purpose-built workspace and, and logistics enablement solutions for small e-commerce companies. Uh, if I you know, put this in context, what I would say is that there are today certainly hundreds of thousands, arguably millions or soon to be millions of uh, small e-commerce merchants um, that now play a critical role in our economy. Uh, and unlike Amazon, they can't afford to you know, amass their own you know, planes and boats and warehouses, uh, but they still need the same uh, uh, essential infrastructure. Um, and so Saltbox provides that. You can visit a Saltbox and get a 500, 5,000, 10,000 square foot warehouse suite that is with, embedded within a, a bigger building, uh, but not just the physical space in a very turnkey way. Also a whole host of mm -hmm. solutions, whether that be full-blown uh, 3PL services or simply on-demand labor. Um, uh, we are you know, aggressively moving into building software to um, you know, provide further leverage for these companies. And so you can think of us essentially as providing, you know, what, what Shopify, so what someone like Shopify is in the, in the digital world of e-commerce, uh, enabling uh, SMBs to thrive there. Uh, we are seeking to build in the physical world of e-commerce, which um, is, is obviously a critical aspect of, of, of making the whole thing work. Are you selling your product to tenants or are you selling your product to owners of buildings? It's a good question. Uh, both, actually. So in that sense, we have essentially two customers. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I'll, let me just say before I go there that we are not a, 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 a technology company in the traditional sense uh, of, of the word. But, but that being said, many companies today that we consider to be uh, technology companies, or at least are venture backed, aren't you know what they would have been you know ten or twenty years ago. When I think about um, you know the purpose of venture capital today uh, and, and and what it means to build a venture backed company, it, it it's really more so a function of, um, of of speed and kind of the scope of, of disruption that you can achieve. How fast can you you know build something uh, you know new essentially uh, than it is just this pure idea of technology. And so um, that being said. Uh, one of the things that does uh, make us attractive to, uh, to, 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 to venture capitalists is that um, uh, we don't own nor directly lease, in most cases, the real estate that we, uh, that we, that we operate. So we uh, uh, maintain as, as best we can an asset-like business model. Uh, so we are working um, with institutional real estate uh, in investors or owners um, who have industrial assets, uh, who recognize um, the opportunity to um, uh, partner with someone like Saltbox and drive uh, increased value from those buildings. Um, and so, um, so, so yes, we have that customer in a sense, but also our, uh, you know, our, our, our end user customer. So, and, and yeah, so before I move into Ashley, I just, I want to get a sense of exactly what you're, so you partner with an owner and then the owner offers your software as a service to the tenant. No, and, and actually, maybe Travis, you want to uh, you want you want to answer that sure. question? Yeah, check it out. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I'll speak as a customer of, of uh, Tyler's and Saltbox on the real estate side. So, effectively, what we've what we've done is we we've bought a couple industrial infill sites in the Los Angeles market, and we've partnered with Tyler and Saltbox for 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 his company to operate out of our out of our location. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not just software. It's, if it's, it's a full service offering, I kind of think of it like almost like a hotel, like they're, they are, you know, we are okay. in a, in a exactly. master services agreement. They're operating the space on our behalf. Um, but we think that there's some pretty exciting reasons to, from an NOI standpoint to do that. Yeah. Okay. I think as Travis said, I hope that from a business model standpoint, a hotel is a perfect example. Uh, and, and the other, the other utility in that example is, just the the breadth of of the activity, you know, uh, it, it, when one 
hires, um, you know, a hotel A to come operate a, a property, they're hiring everything from, you know, the brand to the services, the execution, all these sort of things. And so, um, you know, that's what we're providing, converting that physical space into a salt box, which is uh, this very, uh, you know, uh, kind of purpose-built, uh, you know, uh, uh, workspace, which creates a lot of leverage for small businesses to operate. Got it. Thanks. So Ashley, tell us about HQO. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Ashley Colella, and I'm a, a senior product manager here at HQO in, in Boston, Massachusetts. So probably a little colder than, than all the rest of you folks. But um, uh, HQO is really on a mission to make companies and the people within those companies successful um, within their workspace. Um, and so we partner, uh, actually, very similar model to to try, uh, uh, it similar model in that we partner with landlords and owners of commercial real estate to activate their buildings through our technology and services. Um, and so our goal is to help those uh, help those landlords really understand through data what the people that utilize their spaces want and need in order to make their workplace. Um, in a very inspiring and, um, you know, productive environment um, when they do, um, you know, be within their, within their office space. Um, so I particularly focus on uh, HQOS headquarters, which is the, the admin side of the house where we want to give um, landlords and their property teams and those who um, are servicing the building all the tools that they need to really maximize what they have available, um, both in their building as well as the, the neighborhoods that surround them. So let's let's talk a little more on specifics. And by the way, for the audience, if you have questions for our panel, please put them in the Q&A and I will be happy to pass them along or call on you to, to ask them. Uh, So I, I find logistics fascinating and uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly how it is done. And I, so Tyler, when you, when you talk about providing services, yeah. one of the things I think about is the difference between having uh, a digital identification that stays with every package throughout its movement and just having a barcode that's scanned at the beginning and end of a routing from one place to another. Um, Singapore is talking about, they're gonna be the world's first digital port in that you were going to be able to know where any package that goes into it or comes out of it is at any particular time. Again, not just origin and destination, but every point along the way. You, you basically, you know, take, there's a transponder on every package, you can take your iPhone or uh, or whatever phone you want, your Samsung, and, and track it. Uh, are, is that the sort of technology that you're bringing to the marketplace, or what? T tell us what's innovative about what you do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. The, the simple answer is no, Richard. That's definitely not what we're doing. I think the the problem that we're solving is a, is uh, it is in a, in a sense simpler, more foundational than that. Um, uh, it, 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 it starts with the fact that you know logistics uh, is 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 kind of the foundation, the backbone of e-commerce. Um, uh, you know, uh, as much as we live on the internet today, the fact is, you know, these products which we consume, they begin and end in the physical world, right? And a bunch of hands touch them to get them to where they're going. Um, uh, if you look at the, the breadth of e-commerce today, it's still a fairly, uh, you know, immature, uh, um, you know, market, so to say, in the United States, you know, plus or minus 20% penetration is much higher in Europe, for example. We're going to continue to rise. Within that, though, the SMB now makes up a significant portion, you know, somewhere on the order of $250 billion or so uh, this year, very clearly can be, uh, you know, tracked to uh, very small companies that are, uh, you know, that are shipping goods on the internet or, or rather, uh, you know, uh, across the country. Understood what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, if you if you put yourself in the shoes of those, you know, uh, that, 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 that $250 billion of GMV, those, you know, billions of packages, uh, many of these are being shipped by people who have to drive to the post office or drive to the UPS store, uh, who have to convert their you know, uh, basements or garages into, you know, uh, fake warehouses, et cetera. It's a mass amount of activity. And, uh, you know, if you then look at uh, Amazon, 
you know, a simple observation is that, um, you know, all of their activity begins in a warehouse, uh, right? And they have now tens of millions of square feet of warehouses across the country. And so, you know, at the most basic level, you can say then that uh, a warehouse, as it were, is kind of the foundational input to logistics. But a warehouse is not something that's accessible to, uh, you know, the vast majority of those of those companies. And so we are providing that space. Now, that is has nothing to do with technology, quite frankly, but is, is innovative in the way that we we, 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 we approach it in, in, a, in, in a number of different ways. But more importantly, uh, we're not just providing that workspace. We are providing, uh, you know, in a sense, this kind of full stack solution. You know, you need uh, workspace. You need uh, 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 labor, you need capital, uh, you need connectivity to supply chains, so on and so forth. And you need these things uh, if you are one of those millions of SMBs in a way that is very accessible, very approachable, very affordable. You know, last thing I'll say is if you think about a corollary here, you know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, UPS, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, almost 6,000 UPS stores across the country, right? And it's because they've realized that if they want to service the SMB, um, and by the way, it's much more complex now to service SMB than just you know what, what happens in those spaces. But if you want to service SMB, you know they have to go to where they are, and they have to make it accessible and approachable in a way that you know a million square foot UPS facility in the middle of nowhere just isn't. Uh, and so you know, in, in a sense, um, you know, we are building this logistics uh, infrastructure, this network. Eventually, you know, hundreds and hundreds of salt boxes, uh, which are at once, you know, very, very highly uh, powered logistics facilities, but at the same time, incredibly accessible uh, to, you know, uh, to, to the SMB merchant. And, and, and we think that, that that basic idea and the ways in which we're going about it are, are uh, innovative. So, Ashley, tell us a little bit about how technology, so what you're doing is, a, is property management, right? And, and so tell us how tech or, or no, is that incorrect? I, when I listen okay, to you yeah, talk we're not, about- we're not, we're not directly doing the property management. Okay. Um, we are enabling those to, to use our services and our technology um, to better serve those in their, in their workplace. So property, property so, teams are, are users of, um, you know, parts of our platform um, and are, you know, one of our customers. And then of course their, their customer is our customer as well. Okay. Okay. So how do you make property manager management easier for those that are doing it? Um, the, the the number one thing is the data that we're able to provide, right? We, there, all of the employees with working within the building are utilizing our software. So we're starting to understand what tools within there are, are most valuable to them. So things like ordering food and booking conference rooms or getting mobile access into the building. So we're offering all of that to um, the employees within the building, but then servicing the data around what, what those users are doing and what they actually care about so that they can make better business decisions around where they're in investing their money. So yeah, I, I assume that you employ data scientists on your team. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, we're certainly looking to, like I said, obviously find patterns, but also provide, you know, benchmarking so we can help everyone to kind of understand which of their assets are, are doing well and what areas that they can improve in. Well, I, I, the reason I asked that question is there was some years ago, a very large owner in Southern California asked me to evaluate how they were setting their rents. And I said, sure, share your data with me about rents and we'll develop a model. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And the data were such a mess that you really couldn't do anything with it. So part of a job of a data scientist is not just analyzing data, but setting up a platform so that the data is gathered in a way that it's useful for analysis. That's, that's exactly one of our, our, our key focuses is how do we standardize and make the data scalable so that we um, can do exactly what you just, what you just mentioned. Okay. The standard back. Is, is critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and it sounds boring and geeky and, you know, oh, there's nothing. Oh, we love it, right? <laughs> very exciting about it. But it is like, if you don't do that, you can have the smartest people in the world. It doesn't matter. Because if, if data are not collected in a consistent manner, and, and the way you put it was very good, you, you really can't figure out what it means. And I think what's important to to all of our customers and is that you know they want to understand how they how they match up against their competitors or or, or building to building uh, their own assets. Um, so again, the the data standardization is critical to be able to benchmark across those things. 
So I, I want to go back to Travis and then um, and then we'll we'll start looking at the audience question. So, you know, one of the things to me that's always been a puzzle about um, VC and real estate is the issue of scalability. And, and, I, and people in this audience know, many of them know, I was a big time skeptic about WeWork. Uh, and and it, it's fundamentally this is when you back a software company, uh, you know, and and four out of five of them fail, but the fifth does well, you can print copies of software for next to nothing. And so your marginal cost, once you have the product that people want is very low. So if you can print 10 million copies, you've made a lot of money. Whereas the problem with real estate is once a building is fully leased um, at the market rate, there's not a lot left you can do in terms of growth. So, you know, you can get some accretion. We talk about value added deals in real estate all the time. But that's really about t- taking a building that's worth, say, um, $7 million and turning it into a building that's worth $10 million. It's not putting $7 million of capital into something and winding up with $7 billion at some point later. So, I mean, how does, how does, and when I think of venture capital, I think of, of capital that is looking for these really big bangs and understanding that lots of these companies are not going to succeed, but the ones that do you're looking at ROIs in the triple digits, say. Um, how is that consistent with, what, where, what do you see in real estate that works with the VC model? Yeah, yeah, great, great, great questions, great observations. Like, I, just to start with a couple statistics and then um, we can get into some more of that. So like of the 60, I, I mentioned earlier, like the $60 billion of public market cap that's been created out of, you know, let's call it like 15 prop tech companies in the last 18 months. That is the total amount of prop tech venture capital that's been invested in the, the ecosystem in North America over the last 10 years. So you think about that, right? 15 companies have created that much equity value, you know, to offset all the money that's been invested, you know, over a 10 year period. It's just that that just gives like an order of magnitude of the kind of uh, you know, when, when companies work in this model, like the returns can be uh, tremendous, right? And then, and then if you look at uh, kind of your point around, you know, software companies maybe versus versus other types of business models, you know, there is, you know, there is a certain sort of capital efficiency and multiplier that uh, is is a, is a beautiful thing off of off of software SaaS companies that have success, and you know, the public markets tend to value those. Um, you know, at, at multiples that are, uh, you know, outside compared to outsides compared to their peer group. So, you know, that, that, that is why you'll see venture often skewing towards, um, you know, software centric business models, because it's just so well suited for the way that venture funds um, tend to run. And so I think like, and in, in, in the real estate space, I mean, we were just talking about data, right. And you ask for, you know, send me your data and I'll run some analytics and, help you optimize how you do your rents. I was like, well, you know, um, the data that came over wasn't structured very well and wasn't really in a usable format. And so what you're sort of describing is the need for software, right? Like our industry, whether it's on the real estate side or on the construction side is like, you know, I don't know if it's in desperate need because like performance has been great over the last decade, but like the opportunity, like the first sort of wave of opportunity set here is to kind of digitize like basic workflows that are being done today and to take it from like an analog format, like paper, pen, Excel, you know, tools, you know, maybe like some older web applications, but basically we move from tools that are not creating structured data to tools that are creating more efficiencies and structured data in the process um, that will then allow for uh, uh, you know, greater level of analytics, will allow for greater efficiency in the way that work is completed. Um, and, that, and that's sort of like the phase of the, of the industry that we're in right now. We're seeing a lot of investment in software companies that are starting to digitize these sort of basic workflows or basic functions. So if you take a company like Procore on the you know, construction side, that's now, you know, 10 billion ish sort of market cap. It's been built over a number of years, but you know, effectively they you know, have created some really nice sort of automation software tools for managing construction projects. You know, they're not the only ones. There's been a number in the construction sector. You know, if you look on the operation side, you take a company like Matterport that started in, you know, creating like a digital way to tour a building. You know, the, that that platform is actually now being used to 
um, as a collaboration tool, right? Like it's a digital, you're now taking space, physical space, you're turning it into a digital format and you're allowing teams to collaborate remotely to either walk, inspect, take measurements, and they turn, use that space now, not just from a visual standpoint, to be able to like pull actual data out of those out of those bottles. Um, on the property management side, you know, this year we, uh, well, last year we invested. Actually, we helped kind of build and, and invest in, a, in an artificial intelligence software company that is uh, automating the lease nurturing process. Uh, um, you know, for multifamily, so you know, uh, effectively an, an AI that can sort of behave uh, as the greatest leasing, you know, assistant like on the planet that's been trained on 10 years of lease inquiry, you know, customer inquiry data and can respond, uh, you know, 24 seven, never gets tired within two minutes, every single time can understand all the subtleties that are, that are asked in, 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 in leasing assistant, uh, like in a leasing assistant type role, you know, and provide a greater customer experience, you know, to, you know, um, uh, to potential renters, uh, that's driving higher conversions, which is driving higher occupancy, which is, you know, creating real value uh, in the, in that, in the, in, in those assets. And that's before any potential, you know, reduction in payroll costs. Right. But what's that, what's, but again, tying it back to your initial comment, like that, that AI is also collecting an incredible amount of structured data in every conversation that she has and is getting smarter and has the ability now to start thinking about, um, you know, ways to optimize, uh, you know, rental rates. So yeah, we're, 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 we're in this period of time where we're, we're collecting, we're putting it, we're putting in the rails to collect a lot of structured data and that's going to kind of set up the next wave of growth, um, you know, in the space. Richard, can I add something? Of to course, it? please, Tyler. Go ahead. I just, you know, what one of the one of the the the, the, the uh, you know uh, subsectors of prop tech that he he didn't quite address is our companies that are doing things in the physical world, uh, you know, a la a la WeWork, uh, who, as you know, is about to go 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 public here in a few weeks. Uh, we'll see see how that goes. But you know, the if if you. Uh, it's it's a different business, right? The, the, no question, uh, the margin profile of you know of a, of a software company of Procore is very very different than uh, the margin profile of of my business. As is the case, the margin profile of DoorDash or Uber very different than you know Facebook. Um, but here's the thing, you know, I, I'll pick on an industry. If you look at self storage, uh, there's you know some seventy five billion dollars or so of public market cap today in self storage. Um, uh, and you know, we all better believe that there are, uh, you know, there are startups and venture venture capitalists who are saying, Hey, like, you know, I'd love to have that 75 billion. How can I get it? Uh, and, you know, I think what you end up with is, um, you know, certainly not software companies, you know, one cannot store, uh, you know, uh, old sofas in the, in the internet, right. It, it's gotta be, a, it's gotta be in the physical world, but, um, you know, there are uh, strategies that, uh, you know, when all is considered, uh, may end up being, uh, uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, more efficient than the current model, uh, not software efficient, but more efficient. And the market will find ways to exploit those opportunities and capture them. And so, you know, self-storage eventually will be disrupted. Uh, that new business will probably still have you know, twenty percent margins, uh, but you know, uh, but it's going to be a transference of value, though ultimately, and the, and the consumer will have, uh, uh, you know, uh, likely a a a a a you know better uh, user experience in the, at the end of the day. So let's let's move to audience questions. Let's start with, and I think this is one for Tyler and Ashley both uh, from Lamont Gibson. What are the key drivers in the decisions of which property and property types are chosen for both models? So who is your most natural customer? Um, Travis, I'll take this if you want. Uh, their most natural uh, natural customer is really the, the owners of uh, real estate that are, are looking to build a brand um, and, and build a, a loyal customer base. Um, we find the most success um, where they don't just want to apply our technology to one asset, but actually apply it to their whole portfolio and streamline the overall experience of how those who utilize their, you know, their product, the building, um, to, uh, you know, recognize who they are and what the types of experiences they will have when they're in the building. Similar to 
what um, Tyler said about like the hotel uh, experience, uh, the hotel reference, right? Uh, we're moving towards hospitality and and the customers that that understand that and understand that they have to provide the most elevated experience to their customers are are the ones that we find um, the most success with. So ex- give an example of what an elevated experience is. Um, you know, it's it's not just that the company gets, you know, access to a suite and and here's the space and that's it, but they actually understand that when, you know, what the people, like I said, the, the, the employees within that company want and need, and, and maybe there's a concierge service or, or the, the parking offering is again, more elevated, right? I can actually text to, to get my car pulled up. Um, or that again, the, the neighborhood's activated around me so that my lunch is quick and easy. Um, and any of the, you know, uh, uh, other things I may need to do after work are, are right at my fingertips through technology. So Tyler, who is your typical customer or do you not have one or, or who, who benefits from who benefits most from your services? Yeah. Other than so, really small guys, small, small guys who are shipping stuff to people. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, it's a good question. That, that that's the customer that, you know, uh, we, we talk most about, but the reality is it goes well beyond that. And, 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 and I think it can make a broader point here about you know where I think our um, uh, you know, our evolving thoughts on 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 logistics and physical infrastructure. One one of the more interesting types of companies that we see uh, that that that's making their way to Saltbox are in fact uh, uh, technology companies um, that are um, in in some form or fashion. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, dealing in the physical world, uh, but who are saying, "Hey, I don't want to have." Even though my business touches a physical world, I want to stay up here in the cloud, so to say, and I don't want to have to literally go there. So, I'll give you an example of this. Um, you know, a, a, a customer of ours, of ours is a is a is a uh, corporate housing um, uh, firm, and they they. Uh, they, they manage a corporate housing across the country. They need to uh, warehouse um, um, supplies and, and equipment and such they use in the course of that business. Historically, uh, someone of their nature would have to go and do this all themselves. They'd have to stand up their own, find their own warehouses, find their own labor to staff them, their own management, et cetera. Uh, but Saltbox enables that company to you know, essentially think about the physical world and, and, that, and that need in the same way they might think about you know, their cloud computing infrastructure, their payments infrastructure, and say, hey, we're going to hand this off to you. We don't want to deal with this. And so, um, you know, I, I think as we as we go forward here, we're going to see many more of these types of use cases. We're going to see uh, essentially companies thinking about um, the the uh, their needs in the physical world um, with respect to both, you know, space and logistics activities um, uh, as something that ought to be uh, as accessible and, and and directed as as you know as 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 computing infrastructure is it's just infrastructure and uh, you know it's companies like ours that are making uh, it uh, that that possible. So the, the question from Elizabeth Selby, I think a really interesting one, and I, I'd be curious whether you run into this in your particular businesses. But she notes that with regard to construction innovations, um, regulations are super local compared to federal financial regulations, for example. How much does this drive the ability to implement new technologies and how might this be overcome? Now, I, what I'm curious about is given the nature of your two businesses, which is not construction related, and Travis, I don't know if you are funding construction related business, but but this is, it's surely the case that one of the reasons why construction is so unproductive relative to other sectors is because of the way it's regulated in a whole series of ways. Um, so to what, it, so maybe I'll make the question a little broader, to what extent does the regulatory regime impair your ability to move your businesses forward, if at all? Yeah, I can, I, I offer a point of view here. Yeah. I, um, we deal with, 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 uh, this issue every day, um, as, uh, we are bringing a new innovative, uh, business model to physical space. And we have to 
you know, uh, talk with um, not regulators per se, but certainly, you know, uh, permitters and, 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 you know, and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, folks involved in the kind of building construction regime in, in cities and explain to them, well, what are you doing and why? And, and, and this building has been used, uh, you know, for boxes for, you know, 50 years or 100 years. And now you want to put people in it. And why do you want to do that? And so, you know, we have to deal with that. The good news is that almost always uh, they say, oh, well, that that actually makes a lot of sense. And I can understand why we should be thinking about how to evolve, you know, our codes to allow for this sort of use case. Um, but this is an issue to the extent that we, you know, we, we, we're building a team of people just to focus on, um, you know, uh, uh, you, know uh, you know, government relations, as it were, and navigating those 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 hurdles. So, Tyler, I'm curious, do you do any of your business in California? Yes. <laughs> oh, you do? Because when you yeah. said it was that that officials have responded well, I was curious whether that was true here. <laughs> it, it, it is true. It, it, it's certainly hard to, 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 you know, get to that point, but it, it, it is very true. And and I think, you know, what, it, it, what they're realizing uh, in, in the course of working with us is that, um, you know, uh, the, na- the nature of use cases for these assets is, is fundamentally changing and they are going to have to change their you know, regulatory, uh, you know, regimes along, along with that. Ashley, any thoughts? Um, our, uh, we don't work directly with uh, construction, but I would, I, my thought is more around how do we help um, with other aspects of, of the job for our customers that uh, while understanding that there's, there's more pieces to the puzzle there too. So no specifics on the regulation though. And, and Travis, given what you do, I mean, uh, to some degree, your job is to be at a 30,000 foot level on things. So what do you have a response to uh, this question? Yeah, I mean, the rough, roughly a, a little less than half of what we've invested in is would, would qualify as construction technology. So we have invested a lot against, you know, the thesis that there's room for efficiency and there's room for, you know, better ways of doing things in the construction or development process. So yeah, it's, it's a very, you know, most of that has been, again, like in the software realm. And so, you know, you take a company like Open Space as a, an example that is providing, um, you know, it's giving, uh, you know, contractors the ability to, you know, attach a camera to a hard helmet and create a 3D visual replica of the project that they're working on um, uh, as, they, as they walk the site, you know, each day and go about, you know, completing the work that needs to be done. Uh, that, 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 you know, that business uh, is, is enabling teams to collaborate, you know, um, remotely and, you know, ultimately will, will create value to lots of players, even like in and around the construction ecosystem, like on the financial side, you know, around insurance or the way that a project gets, you know, financed of just having greater visibility and, you know, uh, on, on the progress and the conditions of a, of a, of a job site. Um, so I think like in some ways, like these will have impact on like making the, the, the regulatory process of visiting a site, inspecting a site, you know, getting comfortable with the site, like more, uh, you know, potentially more efficient, but like the reality is this, this is still a very thorny, you know, local issue that, um, uh, needs to be, con- like we take it into consideration, right? Like how fast can a, a solution be adopted? How can it, you know, how fast can it scale? You know what are those those sort of local um, you know regulatory is- issues that need to be that need to be dealt with? So, you know, it it occurs to me, and this this dovetails into the next question about drones and autonomous vehicles. But one one of the things people are telling me is holding up construction at the moment is just getting inspectors out to sites. Uh, it's been a thing that COVID has really slowed down, and of course that slows down the construction process, which in turn makes it more expensive. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a technology out there that could basically do the work of an inspector, like well, measure is- the thickness of cement and so on. And, and that could be truly disruptive and truly helpful, I think. Yeah. So like open space, again, this company that I was just describing through computer vision, uh, again, it's not just a visual, purely visual record of the construction site. It's, it's a, it's point cloud data that is, uh, uh, you know, building up an actual data record of that job site, and it can compare the project to a BIM, you know, to flag potential irregular, you know, you know, deviations from plan uh, and, and create a notification ahead of time. Um, 
you know, potentially the software will uh, could create instant payments, right? Because you're now saying, hey, like this work that needs to be done to construct to trigger a construction draw has been visually, you know, documented by the software and um, has been verified, and that creates the trigger then to release the you know flow of funds. So I think as the visual and data records of uh, construction become a, a more standard tool in the way that things are getting, that the, the way that, that projects are executed on, like there's going to be these benefits to speeding up the process um, that we're that we're pretty excited about. You know, it, it occurs to me too, this could be very helpful to taxpayers. I think about how when the new Bay Bridge was built, there were problems with the rivets that they had that. Uh, that meant that it, it took longer to open the bridge than otherwise was necessary because they replace all these rivets. Well, had they seen <laughs> early on that there was a rivet problem, if there was some a- autonomous method to identify this problem, they could have caught it earlier. And similarly here in LA, we have a new um, light rail line <laughs> called the Crenshaw line, where I guess my understanding is some of the rebar isn't right. And so they're having to redo that. And so that set back the project a couple of years. So that this could be very yeah. exciting. I'm sorry, Ashley. No, I was going to say, I prior to PropTech, I was an insure tech. And I imagine that that industry will also find that technology continue to be invested in there as well. And the more documentation on what something looked like before, um, there are no potential claims, et cetera. Um, that's just even more valuable data to, to insure tech as well. Well, so one of the one of the things in sort of mortgage prop tech, or I don't know whether mortgages are fintech or prop tech or both. It's never been clear to me, but it makes it much easier to do reps and warranties when you're selling mortgages because if you're downloading data from a bank and you're downloading data from the IRS into a loan application then if you sell that loan to Fannie or Freddie or Ginny, they can't come or F- or have it insured by FHA. They can't possibly come back to you and say, hey, you made a mistake. You entered numbers wrong here because you, you are so well documented and the numbers are being transferred directly from good sources to the loan application. And so from a quality control standpoint, that that's really important. I, I do want to get to this question. I think it's a really interesting one um, on thoughts on drones or autonomous vehicle technology for deliveries and, and for offices and pretty much any kind of real estate. This is something people in the real estate business like to talk a lot about. And we would like to hear your perspectives. And, and that's for anybody. I mean, I could start on that one because I, I think on the drone side specifically, like I think, um, uh, what's interesting, whether it's a drone or, uh, you know, your, your mobile device or like a 360 camera that's on a hard hat, these are all just like capture data capture mechanisms, right? And so as LiDAR, uh, you know, kind of continues to follow Moore's law, gets cheaper, gets more powerful, and like the, the, the data that's able to get collected, like through these different capture devices um, becomes more ubiquitous. Like it just, it just, like we are going to be extracting, you know, a lot more information out of, you know, the built world um, to help us, you know, track progress and make better decisions. And so that's like that, this is, we're, we're seeing it happen. Like there's absolute progress in that area and we'll continue to, um, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot of progress there. Any other thoughts? Drones, autonomous vehicles? Nothing in particular. Okay. They're, they're, they're coming. Uh, just uh, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of noise. Um, you know, uh, particularly about uh, autonomous vehicles, and you know, we can debate uh, the, the, the years, but uh, they'll be here soon enough. And and uh, you know, and so I think for someone like us, I mean, we don't. I think one of the things that we we believe very much is that um, you know, there's a there's a, a, a mass um, uh, kind of shortage of, of of physical infrastructure to enable the future of our retail economy in particular, think about e-commerce uh, and, um, you know, uh, and, 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 and so we kind of like sitting at that, at that, the bottom of the stack, so to say, in that, in that sense. Yeah. So be, because we, we have about 10 minutes left, I'm going to combine two questions that, and, and Gene Berinsky asked a question about construction technology. And I, I think we, we co- at least covered that a little bit. So I'm going to 
move on to a combination of questions, which is about the availability of capital. And one is, what's your advice for someone who has a great idea for a prop tech company, but doesn't have the necessary capital or technological background? Um, and uh, Travis, I'm sure you get that question on a fairly regular basis. And then the other one is, Oh, as opposed to benefiting just from the availability of better products and services the prop tech sector is churning out, how can non-institutional participants and individuals in the commercial real estate ecosystem get upside exposure directly from prop tech ventures, i.e. by participating in the capital structure? So there's sort of, there are two sides of the same. How do little guys either get the money or give the money? I think it's the, the theme of those two questions. Yeah. Um... I'm happy to go first, Tyler. I'm sure you could, you know, take take both of those as well, particularly yeah. the first one. Um, yeah, why don't you go? Why don't you take the first one? Uh, yeah, take, sure. I mean, uh, okay. So you, you've got a you've got a great idea, uh, but not the capital nor the technology background. The capital is not a problem. Uh, there's more uh, venture capital available today than any time in history. Um, uh, the, it sounds like the, 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 the human inputs may be a problem. Um, it sounds like you just need a, a co-founder. I think, um, the best way to get a co-founder, uh, is to prove that, uh, the thing you're doing is worth working on the best, you know, so my, very tactically, I would say if you can, uh, if you can get a list of, you know, uh, 10, 20, 50, a hundred, uh, customers who are like, I want your thing. Um, if you just build it that makes it easier to go recruit a really good engineer to help you build whatever that thing is. Um, that's about the best I can yeah, offer. I, I, I agree. Like prove out the product works or that people want it and you know, the rest, the will, rest will follow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, we, we generally don't invest like that. There's every fund, every, you know, venture firm, like there's no two firms that are the same and how they invest and think about things generally though. The more you can show, the more you can de-risk kind of the demand, the opportunity, the market opportunity, um, you know, the more venture capitalists will be uh, uh, chasing you down to invest in your company. What about the other side? And, you know, there are a few firms out there, not so much in the VC market, but are, are trying to make uh, real estate investments available for small retail investors in, in the private side of the market, not the public side of the market. Um, is there, do you see any possibility of small people participating in the VC market as providers of capital at any point in the future? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like I, um, I mean, there are some platforms today that, uh, um, that offer that service. I can't, I'd have to go back and check names and see, like, if I can remember who they were, I, I, I think that'll tell you like, okay. One, the one biggest, the, probably the biggest well-known, you know, well-known one out there is AngelList. Um, AngelList does, you know, it's been around for a while and does get some very interesting deal flow. And so, you know, individual investors can go on there, and, um, you know, write small checks, like relatively smaller checks and participate uh, in these deals. There's some other ones. Uh, that's probably the most well-known one. Um but but uh, you know generally is that going to be a, be a huge impact like on our space like I don't I don't I don't think that's the case and still so and, much and, it. and to invest with a fund like that you still have to be a qualified investor or can just any retail investor invest? There's regulation passed recently that like is lowering the threshold on you know you don't have to be qualified in some cases you don't even have to be accredited right to invest. Um, uh, so, you know, it depends on the platform, what they've qualified for. And I think what startups that are issuing securities on those platforms are willing to, uh, kind of sign up for and commit to on the, on the reporting side. So last question, do you see any incumbent real estate firms out there? And I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but we, we know what I think the questionnaire means by incumbent that are on their own innovating with tech or new operating models, or is this a place where you guys are going to come in and just disrupt the field? Uh, I, I, I'll quickly to say, I, I, I know Travis has thoughts on this, but I, I see two uh, approaches being taken by and large. One is um, incumbents who are uh, aligning themselves with, uh, with folks like Travis and, and, and others by becoming um, LPs in their funds and, you know, gaining exposure uh, in that way. And then, you know, a, a smaller group um, that uh, themselves are, um, you know, both 
investing directly uh, into the ecosystem, as well as, you know, in some cases, building, you know, significant engineering and product organizations that are, that are, you know, bringing innovative products to market. I mean, the, the latter obviously is a lot harder than the former, uh, but, you know, the, the, both those things are happening. Yeah, so like Tyler was saying, I mean, we have in our LP base, we have a number of, you know, very large um, owners, uh, operators, investment managers, you know, publicly traded REITs, private, you know, real estate companies that are LPs in our funds. And we work pretty actively with, with um, you know, most of those, most of those LPs. And, you know, we, so we, I think we have, like, we get to see a little bit of the gamut of what people are doing. Um you know, generally, uh, I'd say the 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 theme that like would that kind of jumps out is like experimentation, right? Where um, uh, you know the some of these groups are like trying to you know partner with or get exposure to some of the best you know strongest founding teams that are innovating in areas that they have particular interest in relative to their businesses, whether it's on the construction side or on the operation side. Um, you know, in the case of that AI uh, company I was describing earlier, uh, you know, some some of these you know, larger REITs even provided data, you know, to help train the models, um, you know, for this company. And in exchange, we're able to kind of influence direction over product and like to really make sure that the solution worked well for the problem that they were trying to solve. Um, uh, and then, yeah, like I, I think we see some in the market actually trying to build their own tools, but it's, it's just, that, that is a tough proposition. Just think about, it's just back to like, just focus, right? Is, is a real estate organization with a technology team going to be able to keep up and compete with a venture back startup that is, uh, you know, has a balance sheet, like completely dedicated to building the very best in class version of that, you know, product quarter in quarter out and not deal with the same, you know, politics and competing for budget and some of the constraints that exist within, you know, a business that's fundamentally doing something else. So, you know, where we, I think there's a little bit of everything going on, but um, that's generally what we're, we're seeing in the market. So I, I and, and we're pretty much out of time, but I, I want to just ask, a, respond to that, but with this, the following question is, didn't Marriott do exactly that years ago when they built their reservation system, which was a real, really great innovation at the time. And they were a pretty well-established company. How is that different? I mean, I know the software they used is ancient by current standards, but that's not. But but that was a remarkable innovation when when they. Did. I think I I don't I'm not aware of this, uh, Richard. But I, but I, I what I would say is that uh, the pace of literal development, you know, has has improved uh, surely in order of magnitude in that time. Uh, the challenge of finding the talent, right, is improved more than that, uh, so on and so forth, you know. And so it's just, it's just that that would be harder today than it would be have been ten years ago. I, and I, I think say. it goes back to probably the beginning of this conversation where we talked about the the data structure and the scalability, right? And and if they don't continue to invest in that area of their business, like how are they going to support this, the tech long term? Um, so we have we have had customers who tried to go build things themselves and then coming back and, and understanding that. We're the experts in designing the experience and in producing the software um, while they're the experts in commercial real estate and their brand and how they want to offer. But that partnership um, is where we've seen the most success. So where they can help us influence our products just as much as we're um, enabling their vision. So uh, we are out of time. Um, Ashley Colella, uh, Tyler Scriven and Travis Putnam, thanks so much for joining us today on Lust Perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the audience for joining us. Uh, have a great rest of your afternoon.